In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And praise to be Jesus and Mary, now and forever. Today on the Franciscan calendar, we have the memorial of Blessed Mary Magdalene Martinengo. She was a Capuchin Poor Clare nun uh, from Brescia in northern Italy. She was born in 1687 and died of tuberculosis in 1737, just shy of 50 years of age. Like many of the Poor Clare saints, going back to St. Clare herself, Blessed Mary Magdalene came from a noble family, and God saw fit to embellish her cultural nobility with an even greater kind of nobility, that which we call holiness. She uh, had very frail health, and, uh, and early on in her religious life, uh, the superiors wanted to send her home, but then there was a change, new elections and new, new superiors, and they decided to, to give her another chance. And, uh, it was a good thing they did because she went on to become one of the great lights of the Franciscan order. Within a few years, she became novice mistress, and then later she became abbess of the monastery. And she was known for her, her many virtues. Um, and uh, she, she had a particular apostolate, you might say, of, of counseling people who came to the grill, you know, uh, to speak with her. And so she would you know, console people that were sorrowing, uh, reconcile people that were at odds with one another. And uh, she, she had that, that gift which Padre Pio had on a habitual basis, in, in his case in the confessional, the gift of reading hearts. Um, I wish I had that gift. It would make things a lot easier in my priestly ministry. Um, she, Blessed Mary Magdalene, was known also for her ardent devotion to our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. And I'll give you two examples that exemplify this. One was when she was still a girl and she made her first Holy Communion. She was so overcome with emotion that the, the sacred host slipped out of her mouth and onto the floor. Um, that in itself might not be the great you know, example of, of her Eucharistic devotion. But what did she do? She stooped down to the ground and she picked up the host with her tongue. Right? And that's a real conscience check for so many people today who wouldn't even consider doing such a thing. You know, they would see the host as something defiled and, and, and they, they would immediately either demand that the priest pick it up and give them a fresh host or, or uh, perhaps they would, like so many people today, just kind of forget that our Lord is there, right? Uh, and our Lord would become trampled underfoot. Uh, how many people there are today who treat our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament as if he were a mere finger food, right? It's one of the qualities of a finger food that it's, it's, uh, it's generally the, the cheaper and less noble foods that we have, right? You, you know, you eat hamburgers with your fingers, but you don't eat a T-bone steak that way. You eat potato chips with your fingers, but, uh, but not a quiche. Now, granted, that might be also because some things are more greasy than others, but, but the point is we, we have this association in our minds that the, the foods you pick up with your hands are the cheaper ones, the party foods, the barbecue for foods, the, the, the ones that fall on the floor. Whereas when you go to a fine restaurant, right, you get out the, 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 the fine china and silverware and all the rest because there's this idea that you're eating more special food. So why is it that we're treating our Lord, you know, the most sacred banquet, right, that one could partake in uh, as a mere finger food? As we know, um, communion on the hand, though it's tolerated in parts of the church in the ordinary form of the mass, um, it was, it's, it's never been the preferred method. Uh, it was introduced back in the, in the 70s by certain bishops who had an agenda, and they introduced it uh, contrary to the law of the church at the time. And both Pope Paul VI and, uh, and St. John Paul II spoke out against it. They didn't like the practice. Um, and uh, however, with all the pressure that was put on the Holy See, it was finally uh, tolerated in certain dioceses. Whereas we get to the, the point today where many people think that oh, communion on the hand is this sacred rite, and they think that if you su even suggest that they receive communion on the tongue, you know, that, uh, you know, that you're somehow violating their dignity. That, if you ask me, is a sure sign that these people uh, don't understand the words of our Lord who says that if we want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must become like little children, right? Little children are content to be fed by others. 
you know, whereas today you have the so-called body snatchers, the people who come up for Holy Communion and, you know, and they'll, they'll, they'll take, literally, there are examples of this, they'll take the host out of the, snatch it out of the hands of the priest and they'll say, I'm old enough to feed myself, thank you. People like that should be barred from receiving Holy Communion altogether, right? What is Holy Communion? It's the most sacred reality that we possess in the entire universe. It's God himself, right? God is present to the whole universe in the sense that, you know, he holds it all together by his almighty hand. He, he, he gives some share uh, right, in existence to it, uh, he who is existence itself. Uh, he's present to all creation, but there's only one place in creation where we can say that's God himself, right? And that's in the Holy Eucharist, precisely because there we have Jesus himself, flesh and blood, soul and divinity. And so it behooves us to give the utmost adoration to our Lord in the Eucharist, right? In the, in the book of Revelation, we see the, the holy angels and the saints in the, in, the, in the heavenly liturgy, what are they doing? They're prostrating themselves in adoration before the divine lamb, Christ, right? At Fatima, uh, in the, the first set of apparitions from the, the angel of Fatima in 1916, the, the angel taught the children the proper attitude in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament, which was to prostrate themselves with their face to the ground and, and offer up prayers of reparation for all the, the sacrileges that are, that are performed, right? How many of us today would even consider doing such a thing, right? I, I remember hearing a, a, a former Protestant pastor speak some years ago who I, I actually met him when he was still a Protestant pastor. He, he said that if I believed what you Catholics believe uh, uh, regarding Holy Communion, I wouldn't just kneel uh, at the moment of Holy Communion. I wouldn't just genuflect. I would approach the altar rail with, uh, on my knees, crawling. Right? If we understood who is there. Right? Um, and so... We, we, it's a, a conscience check for us. What kind of attitude do we have toward our bless, the Lord and the Blessed Sacrament? Is it that reverence that produces a, a holy fear combined with a confidence, the confidence of a child, right? Or is it indifference? I'm probably preaching to the choir with most of the folks here and most of the people listening on Air Maria, but it's good to remind ourselves and to remind others. Another detail that... Uh, that shows us that the ardent Eucharistic devotion of Blessed Mary Magdalene Martinengo is, uh, according to one of the biographies, she, quote, found it a trying duty to leave the house of God after a Holy Communion, end quote. Okay. In other words, she had to tear herself away from the church after Holy Communion. Why? Because she wanted to make longer thanksgivings after Holy Communion. And this is another one of those cases where a lot of people today wouldn't even think Thanksgiving after Holy Communion, what's that, right? Oh, just say, thank you, Lord, and then you walk out, right? Um, by Thanksgiving after Holy Communion, we, meant, we mean spending time entertaining the divine guest who comes to visit us in our bodies and souls after Holy Communion, right? Holy Church teaches us that our Lord is still present in the Blessed Sacrament until the accidents break down. The accidents meaning those appearances and other sensible qualities of bread and wine, which are there as a kind of mystical veil covering the, the reality of our Lord's body and blood. And so how long is that? Um, it's believed at least 20 minutes. Okay, so for at least 20 minutes after you receive Holy Communion, right, uh, you're entertaining a king in your body and soul. That's no small deal, is it, right? Which is why it's, it's inappropriate for us to make uh, uh, Holy Communion and then quickly leave the church, right? Um, in fact, there, I remember there was a pastor some years ago who in his parish put up a big sign over the exit door saying uh, Judas was the first one to leave uh, at the Last Supper. Um, after, that's actually what the scripture says. It says, he, Judas, therefore, having received the morsel, went out immediately, <laughs> you know. It's, you know, when we love someone, we want to be with them. When we love someone, we want to spend time with them, and we cherish the time that we have with them. Um, and so, 
our desire to make a good Thanksgiving after Holy Communion is one of the best gauges of how much we love our Lord, right? If people come into church and they, you know, they're, they're thinking the entire time, they're looking left and right and, you know, and, and tapping their foot and on the ground looking at their watch and thinking, when can I get home and watch the football game? There's something wrong there. It means that their, their love of God is, is little to none, right? Because they don't want to be with our Lord. And of course, if we treat our Lord irreverently, right, after receiving him by ignoring his presence, that's a sin. That's offensive to God, right? How many churches there are today where imme immediately after Holy Mass is done, right, and in the ordinary form of the Mass, that's pretty quick because you don't have all the, you know, the concluding prayers that you would have in the extraordinary form of the Mass. But in the, how many parishes there are today where, you know, immediately after Mass, the people, First, there's the, there's the whole hubbub, you know, there's the, the noise that just kind of rises up, you know, like, like, you know, like the noise that rises up from the pit of hell. And then they go back to the back of the church, and immediately they start throwing down coffee and donuts. You know, do these people have any idea what they're doing? You know, as a courtesy, at the very least, they should ask our blessed Lord whether he wants cream and sugar with his coffee, right? Instead, they just down it all and just thinking about this world. Why? There's a crisis of faith in our Lord's presence in the Blessed Sacrament. And one of the most concrete ways we can express that faith and teach others to express that faith is to make a good thanksgiving after Holy Communion, at least 20 minutes, okay? It doesn't mean 20 minutes necessarily after Mass, but after Communion, okay? Um, that's also an act of charity to other people because it's a good example we can give. You know, the people who come and tap on our shoulders and they want to talk right after Mass, sometimes you could say, I'll meet you back there in 10 minutes. I'd like to make a Thanksgiving now. It's a teaching moment, as they like to say today, right? Um, th these are the most precious moments that we have. And we can spend them thanking our Lord, adoring our Lord, uh, asking him to, to, to send that divine fire in his heart down into, into us and to burn away all of our sins and our imperfections, asking him to strengthen us, to heal the wounds of our souls, asking, us, asking him to give us a, a deeper outpouring of his Holy Spirit, uh, with all the gifts of, and the fruits of the Holy Spirit, which we need in our Christian life. These are the most precious moments of our day. And so let's ask Blessed Mary Magdalene, Martinengo to, to pray for us that we might have a, a healthy share in her own ardent devotion to the Holy Eucharist, that we might reach the heights of holiness as she did and give glory to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.